Welcome, welcome. Good afternoon, good morning, wherever you are. Welcome to the 12th annual Adobe 99U conference. This is our first ever completely virtual edition. I'm William Allen from Adobe. I'm streaming to you live from my living room in California. So welcome here. Where like many of you, I've now achieved a personal record of four months without a haircut. So that's what's going on here. Now we've made the decision like so many events to make 99U completely virtual in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. And look, this pandemic has been devastating for so many people. We've tried to do our part by making our tools and resources more accessible to everyone. Here are a few of the things that we're doing. Adding additional programming on Adobe Live. We've made job postings on Behance completely free. A $1 million Adobe Creative Residence Community Fund. <clears throat> and in the coming weeks, all graduating college seniors will be eligible for a free year of Adobe Portfolio to help them in their job hunt. I know this is a tough time to be looking for a job, so hopefully a free website will help you get there. You can learn more about these and other initiatives addressing COVID on adobe.com. But more recently, the last few weeks have reminded all of us to examine the role of systemic racism in our society and to solidify our support of the black community. We have witnessed stark reminders that racism bigotry and intolerance are tragically persistent issues. Like all of you, I am saddened and outraged. Adobe has contributed $1 million to the Equal Justice Initiative, which is an incredible organization dedicated to fighting systemic racism. <clears throat> and I've been inspired by the personal actions of so many of my colleagues. Personally, I'm trying to channel my outrage into action by focusing on a specific issue helping to pass the Ending Qualified Immunity Act in the United States Congress. But however you choose to act, it's important that we do so now together. So we join those speaking out against injustice and will continue to support, elevate, and amplify diverse voices throughout the creative community. Now for 11 years, 99U has brought together a thousand creatives in New York City for three days of learning and connection. It's one of my favorite times of year, but that's impossible right now. But there's this beautiful silver lining and that we've been able to open up 99U <clears throat> to everyone this year at no cost. And we are honored that tens of thousands of you have chosen to spend your time here with us today. Thanks again for joining us. You're gonna love this. We've pulled together big ideas around creative careers that transcend geography, discipline, and career stage. Our mission is to help you build an incredible creative career taking you beyond the tools of your craft. Now more than ever, we believe that career resources should be accessible to everyone. So 99u.com remains completely free and ad-free, and we're committed to offering more events like this on Behance with access and equity as our top priorities. Now this year's theme was actually set last fall, but it feels more important than ever, the creative self. We'll be unpacking our creative identities and how we interact with each other in the world. Our program's gonna explore the following pillars of the creative self. Purpose, voice, mental health and physical wellness, environment, biases, and blocks. So how do we find and advance our purpose in creative work? How do we establish and refine our unique creative voice? What is the effect of our work on our mental and physical health? How do our interpersonal relationships and physical environments impact our creativity? What prevents us from doing our best work and being our best selves? We want 99U to be a chance for pause and introspection, to reevaluate how you work, to get re-energized about the work you want to do, and to redefine success on your own terms. So here is a look at what to expect today. There are actually two ways to experience the conference. We'll be streaming the series of talks and workshops right here throughout the day. And if you're not there already, come join us in the chat at behance.net slash 99u to participate in this afternoon's live workshops, see additional resources, and to connect with fellow attendees. But what you'll see in the live stream 
was just a piece of this virtual conference. We have even more talks and workshops available to watch anytime you'd like at behance.net slash 99U. You can dive deep with the Creative Self Workbook created by Tina Smaker. You can read more explorations from 99U contributors and visit our virtual bookstore with titles from our speakers. Now, you might have noticed that this year's conference experience has included this, this menagerie of unusual creatures. We're calling these the creative specimens and their archetypes brought to life in beautiful, exquisite detail by my colleague, Mike Brooks, and his collaborator, Alada Mosca. So let's take a look at a couple of these specimens. With its talent for collaboration and communication with other creatures, the Communicatorium Claritus has no known enemies in the creative kingdom. Easily identified by its colorful bloom, the Maximus Designex brings beauty and theatricality to all creative environments. The Sensitivo Empathus is a highly empathetic member of the creative kingdom with a canny ability to hear the needs and desires of other creatures. The Effective Managerum leads its loyal creative flock with empathy and a strategic mindset evolved over years of experience. And here is the rare Multus Tascum, known for its ability to gracefully and simultaneously handle a wide range of tasks, but risk burnout early in its career span. Now you can meet more of these specimens on behance.net slash 99u. Find the one that you identify with most. Let us know in the chat, we'd love to hear about it. Now in partnership with our friends at Paper Chase Press, which is this great second generation family run press and bindery in LA, we're actually making prints of all of these specimens available to order. And all of the profits are going to two great organizations. The COVID-19 Response Fund of Feeding America, which is a hunger relief organization, and the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, which is America's premier legal organization fighting for racial justice. And Adobe will match these donations one-to-one -one up to $10,000. So Nicole Katz, the Paper Chase team, thanks for making this possible. It's a great collaboration. Okay, let's get into this year's conference talks. Now, there are limitations on travel and togetherness imposed by COVID, so we had to get a bit creative with our speakers shooting and streaming their talks remotely from across the globe, from Wyoming to New York to Vancouver to Seoul and more. Our first speaker is a co-founder of Kickstarter, the platform that's brought countless creative ideas to life. As the author of the book, This Could Be Our Future, a Manifesto for a More Generous World, he's providing us a framework for our decisions and ourselves. So let's hear from our first speaker, Yancey Strickler. Brian Eno has always been one of my favorite artists. His music is subtle, but you still never know where it's going. And this is true of his entire career. He started off in the band Roxy Music, then made several amazing solo albums. He invented ambient music. He was the first person to use code and AI to generate music on its own. He produced every important U2 and Talking Heads record. He made a card game called Oblique Strategies. And he even invented the startup sound for Windows 95. This is an incredibly diverse resume, and yet there's this invisible thread that holds all those different projects together. There's no one better at this than Madonna. In the 80s and 90s, the only thing we knew to expect from Madonna was the unexpected. With every album, single, and video, she reinvented herself. And somehow with each reinvention, Madonna became more her. How did Eno and Madonna do this? How is it that they can be so consistently different and yet consistent at the same time? I have an idea about how that is. And in this talk, I'm gonna give you a tool, a kind of a user interface that will let you do the same. But first I wanna tell you how I got here. Three years ago, I stepped down as the CEO of Kickstarter, a company I co-founded, and I was lost. After 10 years working on the same project, I was tired. And it was hard for me to know who I was outside of my identity with the company. 
much less what it is I should do next. I was stuck and I wasn't sure what to do. So I got a notebook and decided I would write down everything that I did know. I started by listing every project I've ever been a part of, even my high school zine. I listed everything I'm good at and everything I'm bad at. I gave myself strange assignments like draw a website of my life, including with all the sections that might be a part of it and what the tagline should be. And out of that process, there were five plausible paths that emerged. Possible next steps that made sense based on where I'd already been. Now, when I saw this list of five things, I didn't want to just jump on one, and I also didn't want to wait for something to happen. So I created another experiment. I would pretend each of these things was my job. I would wake up one day and devote myself fully to living that role. I imagined if I used something like a method acting technique, my body would tell me if it was right or not. And so I actually did this. The first day, I pretended I was a journalist, which was my job before Kickstarter. I researched possible story ideas and wrote pitches to editors. Another day, I imagined turning what was a side project into a full-blown company. And on one day, I pretended that I was writing a book that would communicate a very specific feeling and point of view. And it was the day I spent pretending to write a book that my body told me this was the thing I actually needed to do. And it was about a year into that process that I had my realization. I've been doing a lot of research about self-interest. How is it that we define what is in our self-interest and what's not? And while thinking about this, I decided to draw self-interest. How do I visualize this idea? And when I did, I sketched this image in my notebook, a hockey stick graph, a chart of a line sloping up and to the right. Now, this is how we think of self-interest today. Whatever it is that we want, money, power, popularity, is growing so fast, it just shoots up to the moon. In Silicon Valley, board decks, this is the ultimate vision of success. But as I looked at this picture, I realized it was just a tiny slice of a much larger picture. Because the x-axis, measuring time, it kept going from now all the way into the future. And the y-axis, measuring our self-interest, it also kept going. Because as our self-interest grows, so do our responsibilities. It goes from me to us. As I looked at this graph, I was suddenly confused. What is this whole space I'd never really thought about before? So I drew some lines and tried to carve it out more and discovered there were four distinct spaces of self-interest to think about. There was now me, what I want and need right now. This is how the world tends to think of things already. But there was also a future me, the older, wiser version of me that either becomes real or not real based on my actions every day. There's now us, my family, my friends, my coworkers, the people that are important to me. And then future us, my kids or everybody else's kids. I realized that every decision that I make leaves a footprint in every one of these spaces. All of these spaces are in my self-interest. And yet today we believe that now me is the only space worth thinking about. As I looked at this picture, I thought, what is this a picture of? And next to it, I wrote just a very simple description beyond near-term orientation. That's what this graph was meant to do. Help me see beyond now. And as I looked at these words, I realized they were an acronym. They spelled bento. And I suddenly thought about the bento box, the Japanese packed lunch that has four compartments and a lid. It ensures that you always have a balanced meal and not too much of any one thing. And the bento also honors a Japanese dieting philosophy called harahachibu which says the goal of a meal is to be 80% full. That way you're still hungry for tomorrow. That's it, I thought. Bentoism. It's the same idea, but for our values and our self-interest. A way to not just maximize for right this second, but to leave space for other people and our future selves as well. Now, the bento is not just a thing on the page. It's an actual tool that you can use. Let's imagine a smoker asking their bento, should I quit smoking? To do this is very simple. You just ask each voice on its own, isolate it, and see what it has to say, because each voice will have a different rational point of view. So for a smoker asking whether they're bent or whether they should quit smoking, their now us, which thinks about their family, says, yes, you should quit. We hate it. It's bad for your family. The smoker's future us, thinking about their children, says, yes, you should quit. What if my kid smoked because of me? The smoker's future me says, we want there to be a future me, quit right now. But the smoker's now me says, no, keep smoking. Quitting's gonna suck, we're addicted to nicotine. This is gonna be brutal on now me. And now me has a point, 
based on a very limited perspective. The challenge we face today is that most of us see the world only with this now me lens. We have a passive awareness that lets us see maybe a day in advance, but we have a harder time seeing beyond that. This can cause us all sorts of problems, like making addiction seem rational. Hey, it's satisfying our now me urges, so we should keep doing it. Passive awareness can also make something like sacrifice unthinkable. Giving up something now to get something more later just seems irrational from this perspective. What we really need then is an active awareness to expand the perimeter of our self-interest beyond now me to include the people we care about and the future. With an active awareness, you seek solutions that honor all four spaces of the bento. This is your idea of what a good decision is. Now, this is a lot easier to do when you know what's going on inside each of those boxes for yourself. And to do this, you answer just a very simple question in each one. What does now me want to need? What does my future me want to need? And so on. The first time I did this, I brainstormed a ton of answers. I need security, I need challenge, I need love, all sorts of things. And then I drilled that down to a simple phrase that I could keep in mind. My now me, it wants to show people the matrix. I'm at my best when I'm connecting ideas, making people see things that are hard to see. My future me wants me to create harmony, bring people together, and to never sell out. Don't sell out. This has been a strong theme in my life. My now us is about a small group of friends and family and being hyper-present with them. And my future us imagines a world where there's still a matrix, but the matrix is working to our benefit rather than against us. Now, having these ideas in mind is incredibly helpful because it helps me make decisions and shape my life. Not long after creating the bento, I got asked a question that immediately challenged my assumptions. I was invited to do a talk for a, a company that I didn't particularly like. They felt off values to me. In the past, when I've been invited to do things like this, I've always said no and also felt kind of angry for even being asked. When I asked my bento whether I should do this talk for a company I didn't like, I couldn't believe what I learned. My now me, which wants to show people the matrix, said, yeah, this is absolutely what you're about. My now us, which wants deep time, said an hour and a half to share ideas is cool with me. My future us, which wants to build a better matrix, says, absolutely, you don't just want to preach to the choir. But my future me, which says, don't sell out, it accused me of selling out. It said I was only doing this for the money. It said no. And I suddenly realized that this voice that had made me angry in the past was my future me. And my future me was acting like a bouncer, this big dude standing outside, looking out for my values, making sure things didn't come in that I didn't want. But by seeing the whole bento, by being able to see the bigger picture, I had the right to tap that bouncer on the shoulder and say, no, nah, it's cool, I got this. And so I ended up making an entirely different choice than I would have otherwise, and yet being certain that it was something that was in my self-interest and fulfilled who I am. Because I had this active awareness, I could see that even though one part of my bento wasn't so sure, it was still the right thing to do. Now, this bento structure can work for people, but it also works for organizations. A company's bento is quite similar. It's now me as whatever its current priorities are, the annual goal or the quarterly goals. It's future me as this idealized self, this brand promise, the ultimate version of the company it's always trying to live up to. A company's now us are its stakeholders, its investors, its customers, its employees, the community, the suppliers that rely on it, and what that core promise is to each of them. And the company's future us is its vision statement, where it wants to be in 10 years. So for a company to use their bento, it means making choices that honor each of these spaces, that successfully hold these tensions between what the public expects and what you expect out of yourself. So if we imagine a company like Apple, we can map their bento. Their now me are tools to develop humankind. This is Apple's mission statement, as well as whatever its quarterly goals might be. Apple's future me brand ideal, it's think different, right? It's something we've seen in many ad campaigns. Apple's now us, their customer promises are super interesting. From the beginning, Apple has always been the technology that just works. If you compare it to DOS back in the 80s, it was always the easier to use one. And Apple always promises privacy and a walled garden for their services. And that future us for Apple is still developing tools that advance humankind as well as growing Apple. So when Apple launches a new product, they should think of it from the perspective of the bento. 
what will fulfill all of these expectations. And this shows us why something like the AirPods are such a successful product. They think different, no wires, but they also honor this idea of just works. You put them in and they play, you take them out and they stop. It fulfills what people expect from Apple. If you contrast that with something like the touch bar, which is a failure on many of their computers, yes, it thinks different, but it doesn't just work, it doesn't do anything. And that's why it didn't ultimately work out. So the shift from this passive awareness, only trying to look out for what you want right now, to this active awareness, seeing the full perimeter of your self-interest, is what allows you to ultimately fulfill your potential, to be the best version of yourself, and to create choices that are coherent with who you are. In physics, coherence is a word just meaning multiple waves sort of working together in synchronicity, just this perfect balance. In making decisions that fulfill every aspect of your bento, are a kind of self-coherence. Now, doing this on the regular basis is something that takes practice, just like any kind of muscle. But there's a simple practice that I've begun doing once a week that's really transformed how I think about my time. I draw a blank bento like this one and ask, how should I use my energy? And I ask these different parts of myself what I should do just in the next seven days. I use this to make my to-do list for the week ahead. Now, if you're willing to go with me for just a second, I'd, I'd love to take you through the kind of meditative process I do to place myself in this world. So to do this, I need you to close your eyes with me and just follow along, and we'll see what we discover. So to start, just close your eyes, and I want you to look straight ahead, looking straight ahead like you're looking into a mirror, and you are looking at now me. You're looking at yourself right at this moment. I want you to start just by taking stock of what's going on in your mind. Are you feeling calm and relaxed? Are you focused or are you anxious? Does your body feel okay? Do you need to stretch? Do you need to exercise today? How does your now me feel? Now, keeping your eyes closed and still looking straight, I want you to tilt your head up. And now we're looking up into the now us space of your bento. The now us for you is everyone that you love and care about. It's not every person in the world, just the people that you feel emotionally connected to. What I'd love for you to do is I'd love you to take all those people, your friends, your coworkers, even your pets, and cram them all onto a sofa. Now that you've got them all on there, just take a Polaroid and now look at each of their faces one by one. Those are the people who are counting on you. Now, keeping our head tilted up, let's turn slightly to the right, and now we're looking at future us. Future us is that same Polaroid of your couch with all the people you love except now 20 years into the future. Everyone's older. You can't believe how big your kids are. You realize some of the people in the last picture aren't there anymore. And there are new faces you don't recognize, but you know that they matter because they're here in this frame. Take a second to look across these faces too and know these people decades from now are counting on you right at this moment also. Now, keeping your head turned to the right, look straight ahead, and now you're looking at future me. You're looking at the older, wiser version of you. Your hair is white or salt and pepper. Your skin is wrinkly. Your future me loves you more than anybody. They look at you with compassion. You can feel it as they smile at you. You can feel their warmth as you touch their face. This beautiful person, this person that lives up to all the things you wanted out of yourself, this is you. This is you, who you are becoming right now. And now let's turn and just face straight ahead again, looking back at the mirror of now me, and you can open your eyes. Those are the dimensions of your life. Every time you make a choice, those are the parts of yourself that are speaking to you, whether you listen or not. Those are the things that we're shaping and affecting. Now, I'm pretty sure Madonna and Brian Eno weren't using the bento exactly, but I think this mentality and this notion of coherence explains what makes them so successful. So here I've made a version of Madonna's bento, just my guess. Madonna's now me is to take back and redefine female sexuality that was so core to her identity as an artist. Her future me is to never repeat herself. Madonna's now us was New York City cool, East Village, Soho. Her music always reflected what was coolest in the coolest part of the world. And Madonna's future us, that larger picture, was her as an icon. She always saw herself as larger than who she was. 
So if we look at Madonna's career, we can imagine every decision she made was from this perspective. She was trying to honor each of these ideals simultaneously, and this allowed her to always be new while being the same. For Brian Eno, it's very similar. Early in his career, he did an interview where he described himself as a non-musician musician. And this kind of self-awareness is very present in all of Eno's work. For his future me, I think Eno is always leaning on his curiosity and openness to technology, and the fact that he's not egotistical in his work at all. For Eno's now us, when he's making art, I think he's thinking about other artists. And he's even thinking about himself as an artist and being critical in that kind of way. This is where his self-awareness comes through and projects like Oblique Strategies make sense. And finally, Eno's future us is fascinating because if I think of his work making generative art, where he's building code and making programs that are making Brian Eno music for eternity, maybe Eno will be the first non-living living artist. And that kind of strange upside downness of his career will continue even after he's dead. Now, I can't promise that using the bento will turn you into Madonna or Brian Eno as much as we might wish that. But I can promise that it will show you what it means to be coherent, what it means to make choices that are in integrity with who you are. And once you know that, you free yourself from not just following what you did the day before, but carving a path that makes sense for where you ultimately want to be. By embracing the bento, this is the way to become your best possible self. Thank you. So Yancey's book, This Could Be Our Future, is available in the 99U bookstore. Just scroll down and you can check it out there. Our next speaker is an academic and journalist whose acclaimed 2019 article for BuzzFeed News called How Millennials Became the Burnout Generation helped kickstart the ongoing backlash against productivity culture. Speaking to us in a pre-recorded talk from the beautiful state of Montana, let's welcome Anne Helen Peterson. To be very honest with you, I really didn't want to give this talk. Usually I love writing talks. I was a teacher and a professor for almost a decade, so it usually feels like giving a lecture, only with a fancy Britney Spears mic. But something has happened over the last three months of my life, something that almost everyone watching this right now will find familiar. Working is really, really hard. The very notion of pandemic isolation unlocking some deep well of creativity and productivity, that feels bonkers to me. I am usually a voracious reader of fiction, but I have read one, one book since the shit hit the fan in mid-March. And then the only way I was able to do so was isolating myself entirely from the news for 72 hours. I somehow managed to actually perform the essential functions of my job every day, but it is with great effort amidst near constant distraction from Twitter, from the never ending drip of coronavirus news, from the house plants I spend an unreasonable amount of time just staring at. I've worked from home for years, so that part's not new to me, but the start and end of the work day feels porous. Work still expands to fill all the open spaces in my life, and my life often feels like nothing but open space these days. I feel like I'm simultaneously working way too hard, could not possibly work harder, but still falling short again and again on the goals I've set for myself. I try and remind myself that we're undergoing seismic, society throttling change. I repeat, there is no need for productivity during a crisis as if it's a mantra. I remember that I'm worried for my own health and my partner's health and my parents' health and my friend's health that our nation is at war with itself about how to handle the virus, that so many of us are either already experiencing economic precarity or waking up every morning waiting for it to arrive. The day before I started writing this, my company announced plans for massive furloughs that we all know are layoffs. Everyone keeps talking about the end of my industry as we know it. Work right now is trauma. I can remind myself of that, but it only helps so much. My brain, like a whole lot of other millennial brains, has been broken. 
I don't know how to remove myself from the compulsion for productivity, even though I resent it. This talk is just another thing for me to struggle against, another thing to resent, especially since it requires all of these new skills, like, I don't know, filming myself at a dining room table or making a PowerPoint to accompany a talk about not wanting to make a talk. And as you might've noticed, I've given up on the idea of making a PowerPoint entirely. But I wanted to be honest with you because if you're watching this, you've convinced yourself that this is a good thing to do during a pandemic. A good use of your time, something that might make you feel better or smarter about the world or yourself. But you might also feel distracted, like there's something else you should be doing that's actually more productive, or like you just wanna go take a nap. And I get it, I really, really do. That's because all of us are experiencing some variation of pandemic burnout. Pandemic burnout is like regular burnout in so much as it's hard to distinguish from depression and just general feelings of all encompassing sadness and fear mixed with apathy. And regular burnout, at least the way that I've been thinking about it for the past year and a half, is the condition of working with such vigilance for so long, but somehow never getting close to a feeling of stability and never feeling any form of catharsis. You work until the point of exhaustion, but instead of stopping and recovering, you just keep working more. Because what other option do you have? All of the things in your life, even ones that you once enjoyed, flatten into one, an endless to-do list that seems to keep refreshing itself. A long vacation provides some sort of a fix, but only temporarily because the real problem isn't your specific job or your personal habits with your phone. It's the way we've been trained to think of ourselves and others as productivity robots. It's the fact that everything, even our so-called leisure, has come to feel like a form of work. It's the normalization of instability. So how does this change during a pandemic? It doesn't matter whether you have kids at home or not, whether your country or state is gradually reopening or not, whether you or a close member of your family has actually had COVID, whether you've been laid off or still working, everything is hard. There's a constant feeling that you're doing something wrong or aren't doing enough. Survival feels like it has fallen entirely on the individual and the social safety net continues to disintegrate. You're trying to do your best with educating your kids, with tasks at your current job, with showing compassion as a manager or a friend or a father or as a daughter, while also grappling with incredible uncertainty about what the next few years of our lives will bring. And it's not just, will my coffee shop ever reopen? It's, will the United States remain a democracy? It's not just, will I ever have childcare again? It's, will I ever see my mom again? And all of that is exhausting, especially when there's no finish line. You're just running a marathon with no finish line for the foreseeable future. Before the pandemic, most people I know rarely found weekends restful. They were packed with activities, games, obligations, and for a lot of us, more work. But they at least marked some sort of break, however blurry, from the rest of the work week. A mood shift, an activity shift, an attitude shift. Now there's no weekend, there's just the end of the week. There's no real leisure, there's just time. Time in which we might momentarily, blissfully forget that everything has changed before we're boomerang back into reality. There's no restaurant night, there's no play date, there's no movies with friends. Or if you live in a place where some of these things are now possible, they're just not the same. All of them are shadowed with fear and suspicion of others. The other day, a friend of mine posted a photo of a hike with her two friends to Instagram. This friend of mine is white, educated, and middle class. She works for a nonprofit. Although between paying for daycare for two kids in a major city, she and her husband are barely scraping by every month. And now she, like a lot of people, spends her days trying to figure out how her life can and will change in the months to come. Pictured, the Instagram says. Saturday respite, family hike in the woods. Not pictured. Working late nights, juggling childcare with deadlines, indecision about what to do about childcare in our apartment, where we will even live for the next year, lots of tears. Feeling worn down by endless decisions and grief, even though by all measures, we are the lucky ones. We are grieving our lives as they once were. 
We are grieving the lives that we had planned for ourselves. In many fields, from journalism to academia, from event planning to zookeeping, getting laid off right now doesn't just mean struggling for a few months to find a job or reconciling yourself to less pay. It means the end of a career, and with it, the end of a particular conception of self. Because for so many of us, bourgeois millennials in particular, our careers have become deeply intertwined with our understandings of self. We work so much and have worked for so long to get even a tenuous hold in our industries. And if you take away what I do, what's left? Sure, we're still partners and mothers, friends and members of the community, but we've spent so long concentrating our efforts on work that the prospect of losing it feels like an existential crisis. I find this especially true of millennials, many of whom have graduated from high school or college or grad school right into the Great Recession of the late 2000s. Some of us were forced to move back home and endure the shame directed our way because of it. Others lost jobs, cobbled together part-time work, or went back to undergrad or grad school in hopes that a degree would offer some semblance of security that we'd never found. Reports of a robust and growing economy didn't square with the way we were experiencing the world. Drowning in student debt, struggling to reach or maintain middle-class status, feeling like we'll never be able to afford homes or even children, saving very little at all, and convinced that we'll work until we die. Even if we'd achieved some semblance of security, we were just waiting for the other shoe to drop. If there's one thing millennials have internalized, it's that everything you've worked for can go to hell very quickly and through no fault of your own. Whatever you were told as a child about what you deserved, about what hard work would bring you, those myths have been thoroughly punctured. Part of the sadness of thinking about whether you'll need to move back home with your parents is that for some of us, we've only been out of our parents' home for less than a decade. As Annie Lowry put it in The Atlantic, the economic cataclysm ushered in by the pandemic near guarantees that millennials will, quote, be the first generation in modern history to end up poorer than their parents. Millennials, in other words, don't stand a chance. All of this is very bleak. You just wanted to watch a clever TED talk with a fun PowerPoint slide. I am a total downer. But all of this is really weird right now. This is like a sci-fi movie. This is one long unfurling trauma. Any attempt to pretend otherwise is a lie. And it behooves none of us to pretend that nothing has changed. That no one is suffering and despairing in ways large and small every day. Or let me modify that. It only behooves those in power who stand a profit off the fiction that life can and has returned to normal. If you feel less productive, it's because you are. The hard thing for us as workers, as creatives, as managers to understand then is that there is nothing wrong with that. We are doing the best we can, but everything, at least for the time being, has changed. And so too should our understandings of what's possible and what we should expect from ourselves and others. If you can extend that grace to others, you can give yourself permission to do something that might actually help your productivity in the end. You can do nothing. You can go on a long walk without your phone. You can lay on the ground playing trucks or ponies or just talking with your kid without thinking about what activity you should be doing with that kid instead. You can, like me, spend a lot of time contemplating your houseplants. You can make something to eat if that feels right and zone out in the preparation, or you can eat popcorn and stare at the ceiling. You've all read the studies about how actual rest from work in the end, ultimately, makes you a better, clearer, more creative thinker, which in turn makes you a better worker. So now is the time not just to read those studies, not just to read that, but to live that. If your manager is surveilling your work, that's BS and I'm sorry. If they're not, or if they're a human with an ounce of empathy, have a very real conversation with them about how the rhythms of your life need to change. Maybe you've already had that conversation at the beginning of the pandemic, but maybe you need to have it again. I feel very differently about, well, everything right now, months into the schedule than I did at the beginning of March. If you're your own manager, which is to say, if you're a freelancer or self-employed or the person who makes you feel the worst about what work you do, is it possible to look at your own behaviors 
and diagnose them for what they are. In most cases, being far harder on yourself than you would ever be on anyone else. You can recognize that your fear is warranted, but the best way to assuage it, aka by completing more work, might actually be to work fewer hours. Since writing about millennial burnout last year and then spending the last year expanding that article into a book, people often ask me if I figured out the cure for it. Absolutely not. But the one thing I did figure out is how to recognize the behaviors that led to it and call them what they were. That didn't mean I was always able to stop them, but I could see them. Instead of just lumping everything into a big bag of this is just the way my life is, one never ending map of work. I'm trying to do the same right now with this particular form of pandemic burnout. When I suddenly find myself exhausted or deeply sad or incredibly angry, I remind myself, ah oh yes, it's because we're battling a society throttling pandemic and tens of thousands of people have died. When our company announces layoffs and I stare at a Google Doc for three days, unable to write a single sentence, I say, a fifth of the country is out of work and I'm terrified that I will be too. When I can't seem to reply to the simplest emails in my inbox or clean the stovetop or even open a book, I try and remember, you are very sad and scared. And when I dread writing a talk in a way that I never have before, it's because nothing, nothing feels right. I'm so scared for what the next months will bring, but so uncertain about basically everything. But the one thing I know is that even before this pandemic, hearing from literally thousands of people, millennial and otherwise, from across the world, is that the way things were, it wasn't working. The way we've organized work, the way we interact with technology, the way we conceive of parenting, the way we've turned all corners of our lives into an opportunity for productivity, it wasn't working. We're sad and exhausted and anxious. We don't have time for each other or for our communities. Everything we say that we care about, including ourselves and our relationships, are things that we give ourselves the least to. The pandemic has clarified so much. It's made it impossible to ignore the dilapidated state of so many American systems. It's highlighted whose work is actually essential which leaders actually care about people who aren't like them and whose lives are considered expendable. The supply chain is broken, the social safety net is in shambles, and a whole lot of things we thought of as needs, including the need to work all the time, have revealed themselves as unnecessary. So ask yourself, over the last four months, amidst all of this confusion, what has become clear? What is truly invaluable? And what have you already proven you can live without? What do you miss and mourn the most about the life you had before? What do you want the world to look like moving forward? What changes in your life will you actually dedicate yourself to preserving? We are living through a period of global upheaval, but if we build the world back again exactly as it was before, what a disappointment, what a loss upon loss that will be. Life doesn't have to be the way that it was. Work does not have to be trauma. We can have selves, real and vibrant selves, outside of jobs. But we have to see that and act on it decisively. People say that the pandemic will be a life-defining event for entire generations. But what if the changes that happen afterwards on every level of society were two? Thank you, now go do nothing. Anne Helen's upcoming book, Can't Even, How Millennials Became the Burnout Generation is available for pre-order in the 99U Bookstore. Again, just scroll down, you'll see it there. Now, our final speaker in this morning's session is a creative director at Instrument, an adjunct professor of design at Portland State University and a practicing artist and illustrator, speaking to us in a pre-recorded masterclass from Portland, Oregon, Nishat Akhtar. <laughs> Hey, I'm
I'm Nishad Akhtar. I'm a creative director at Instrument. I'm an illustrator and a designer. And today I'm going to give a talk to you called Look Around You, which is about the power of noticing and observation and how that really simple thing uh, can be translated into some fun activities that help fortify the creative self and connect you back to your communities. So have you ever thought about all of the little things that you take in passively on a daily basis? Like, my bedroom is this really, really dark twilight blue. And when I wake up in the morning, I don't ever think this bedroom is blue. This furniture is a, a color of gold. Um, I don't ever think about those things. I wake up in the morning and I take however many steps it is to get to the bathroom to brush my teeth and fumble down the stairs to make my first cup of coffee. That's just like, that's how my morning goes. Um, but there's so many little intricacies in, you know, the architecture of the house that I live in, the intentionality of the colors that I've put around, the artwork that I've hung up, any of that, that I'm sort of just passively taking in at this point. But there was a moment where I had been really intentional about that. So if you were to open your explore page on Instagram and see the grid of images uh, that's recommended to you for things you might like, those are images that you also passively take in every day. I know I do. And for me, I happen to have a grid full of lots of cute dogs. German Shepherd puppies, I love them. They've got these floppy ears and I just wanna, I, don't, I wish I had one. And I, you know, they're, German Shepherds are Velcro dogs. They stick with their people, they're protective, they're loving. I love that. So I happen to spend time looking through Instagram, searching that, liking those images. And those images are being fed back to me. And I wanna see that. I also am a huge basketball fan. I miss the NBA uh, and in this time in particular, I'm doing a lot of searching of highlights and liking those things just to get a little taste. And you know, my explore page is feeding that back to me because it knows at some point I chose to search for those things. And so this machine intelligence says, hey, you might like this, I'll send it your way. So I'm not necessarily actively searching for these things, but I am actively engaging and happy to see them. I love Zion Williamson. He's a power dunker. I got to see him here in Portland and I was hoping for a shattered backboard and I still hope that that can happen someday when he gets back to it. Um, but in the meantime, these are images that I'm taking in every day and uh, not necessarily thinking about why, but just feeling the enjoyment when I see them. Spotify is another one that knows me all too well. I think I can click into the app and see records that I haven't listened to in maybe 20 years that Spotify is recommending to me. And like, yes, I want to listen to a B-side Wu-Tang record. Yes, I want to hear um, some industrial record from the early 90s. And uh, I, I love that. So like, isn't it wonderful that the internet already knows me, really knows what I want and like just really gets me? These networks output this eerily accurate portrait of who I am from, you know, basketball to German Shepherd puppies to Wu-Tang. And I think that's great. There's, there's this really beautiful portrait of myself that's being painted and given to me without me really having to think about it. But you know, this portrait wasn't passively created. In the first place, I helped create it. I made queries about songs that I liked or I you know, in, searched for certain kinds of sports highlights. I helped create that. And you know, at the risk of sounding paranoid, I have a proposition that there's a little bit of danger in passively experiencing imagery and music and um, anything every single day. Um, and I'm not gonna stop using like Pinterest or Instagram or Spotify as ways for learning about new music, but I you know, have a bookshelf full of art books that I can really spend time um, you know, with an artist and understanding something about them and what it is that they made and why it is that they made it and how it is that they made it and how their practice came to evolve and getting deeper into the story of an artist um, I think helps me understand how I can get deeper into my own practice. Um, I also have a shelf uh, that's building of records where I can just take 20 minutes and put an actual record on the record player and lay on the floor and listen to an entire half of a record or the whole one if I've got time and dedicate that time for this artist who has created this music to come into my ears, into my body, my brain, my feelings and just 
absorb that. That time with that artist is really powerful. So if our daily feeds of inspiration or music are shaped by algorithms telling us what we like, I think we have a really important responsibility to continue to investigate for ourselves what it is that we like. Not just letting something else tell us, but for us to do personal investigation and say, why is it that I like this thing? Or how is it that this is affecting me? We have this responsibility to shape these algorithms that shape us. And I, I call that creative autonomy, which is your own sensibility, the things that you like, the things you don't like. You don't have to like everything. Um, but kind of knowing why and being able to, you know, have conversation around that um, is important. You know, your input affects your output. Everything you take in, if you think about like when you're creating a project, like a design project or an illustration project or really anything, typically you'll do a lot of research. You'll look at what's out there. Um, you'll find inspiration and um, all of that stuff that you're taking in is what's going to affect what you're making. Um, but I don't just mean that. I mean like the things that you read affect maybe the way that you act. Uh, the music you listen to can affect how you feel. You can set the tone by putting on like a really hype record and you know it's going to make you feel good and you start dancing around and it uplifts you or maybe you're in the mood to just like revel in feeling sad and want to put on some sad songs and let it out. Um, all of the things that you take in affects sort of what you put out and that can be within your work and it can also just be how you feel every day. And it's bigger than data. It is the conversations you have, the you know way you design your house, again, the music you listen to, the books you read, all of that. And really this is just a reminder that your output is controlled by uh, one common factor and that is you. It's you. What you take in affects what you put out. And when I talk about like the power of noticing and the power of observation and slowing down, it's taking the beat to think the things that you care about, the things that you become intentional about, the things that you take some time for will be the things that are coming into you and affecting your relationships, your work, and all of that. So how do we hone this power of noticing? It is so simple and sometimes simple things are the hardest things. You know, I think that life can be really complicated and uh, we accept it as that and boiling things down is uh, way more challenging. But I think starting small and understanding that just like this simple pillar is, I don't know, useful, um, is worth trying. And you know, it may seem really obvious but just the simple act of noticing and observing is a skill to be honed and it's something that every designer and successful creative has done or continues to do. Um, you know, when you're first in school, if you went to school uh, for art or design, you learn about color and juxtaposition and how to frame things up in a way that are pleasing. Um, those building blocks, we maybe kind of come to passively just do but uh, are really powerful to our creative process. And I don't mean like color composition or whatever. You could be a musician and, and this act of noticing still applies. So it's late spring here in Portland, Oregon, where I live. And it is like a key time for observation and noticing just naturally. We are evolving from the dark rainy winters to, you know, um, flowers and color bursting out on everyone's gardens that you walk by in the streets. Um, we start to sort of peel off those big puffy layers from winter and realize like, wow, I have a body that exists outside of just my coat and my hoodie. Um, so spring is just like this perfect time to say, okay, my sensitivity is dialed in to notice the things around me um, because they're changing around me. You know, I would be remiss if I didn't sort of bring up the point of this very specific time that many of us are in, which is, you know, shelter in place and quarantine. Um, and I think we're even more heightened to notice the things around us because our surroundings are so limited. Uh, maybe you're sitting on your couch uh, every single day and, and 
um, starting to notice like, wow, that picture frame is actually really crooked. Whereas if you had been passively walking by it every day, like I was talking about getting up out of bed and running to brush my teeth in the morning, um, if I suddenly was only limited to that space, maybe I would really start to notice uh, how the artwork on the wall is hanging or maybe there's like dust on the uh, baseboard starting to develop. Um, you know, there's really big challenges in being limited in our, um, you know, mobility and access to other people in terms of the physical world. But I think also there is um, a little bit of an opportunity in this time of being forced to slow down and limit our space to honing that uh, notion of noticing. I started writing this talk in January and I could not have imagined what has happened in our world, but my own life circumstances had led me to realize that I needed to slow down and that I needed to just um, find some new creative tactics for connecting back to myself. So what are these things? Let's get into it. There's a couple things to try and it's a focus on listening and looking. But I think underneath that, there's this layer of describing what you are experiencing, seeing, understanding, feeling. And I think that that's a really important component. So there's this passive act of seeing things go by you every single day or scrolling through your phone and seeing things go by every day. But if you were to stop, look at something and then have to describe it and maybe even evaluate how it makes you feel or um, you know what it reminds you of, now you're starting to get into this like, um, you know, relationship with uh, color or painting or design or anything like that to understand like what it is that's resonating for you. And um, for me, that's been the act of how I can connect back to myself uh, while looking at art. And, you know, creative connection for me has always been just like visceral and tangible. Um, I grew up in a community of friends who were all artists and musicians. If someone was playing in a band or DJing in the block party, someone else was drawing the flyer and silk screening the t-shirt. Or even if someone was a car mechanic, they were figuring out some really cool way to, you know, customize a, a pinstripe or a little logo that they could have in their car club. There was always this sense of um, community around creativity for me. And I noticed late last year I was working so much and that's where my main focus was and my life kind of took a major pause because I, um, both my parents got very sick and I had to go home. I had to fly back to the East Coast and spend a significant amount of time there and my life went on pause, my, you know, my design life, my illustration life this creative world that I was a part of, everything just stopped. And the only thing that really mattered was my connection with my family. And um, that is truly important. Um, I also went through a pretty extreme heartbreak and the future vision that I thought was going to be my life wasn't. So the ground beneath me was gone and the vision ahead of me was gone. I wasn't in the, in my own environment and, I felt truly untethered from being a creative person, which is sort of who I've defined myself as. Um, and I had to figure out a way to jumpstart it. So there's a lot of lessons I learned from that time. Um, but, you know, if I was to think about the lessons that could translate from that time of, you know, spending day in and day out with my dad in the hospital and then evenings with my mom, who was also going through some, something, um, I have a list of things that I learned when my dad was in the hospital, uh, which is slow down. And it's not just like slow down as a demand, like it is okay to slow down and to look around you and to observe what you see in a person, in you know your environment, ask the question, why? Why do you like something? Why is something happening? What is the intention behind something? Engage with the people that you love, know and admire understand different contexts, you know, we, we come from different places and as people, but um, I think that there's often a common ground we can find. Um, and listening, I think, uh, 
you know, there's, there's the ability to hear and then there's listening. So I think that the difference is where you're having this intentionality and care around taking in what someone is saying. Okay, so on that note of listening, I started this experiment, activity, I don't really know what you would call it. It's not really a game, but it's just something I started to do in the beginning of this year after I was feeling like, whoa, I haven't been around my friends in a long time. I can't remember the last time I was on a dance floor with someone. Um, I was just feeling really disconnected. So I started this um, experiment or project or whatever you want to call it. Um, it doesn't have an interesting name, just one week, two records is what it is. And what that entailed was every week starting January 2020, and I'm not a person to make resolutions, it just happened to be like the week that I started, is I would ask a friend to give me two records that they are really feeling right now or that they've loved for their whole life or that they thought I might like. And it you know didn't have to be physical, it could be digital. There's like basically everything's available now on the internet. So. A friend would give me two albums that I would listen to and I would pretty much exclusively listen to those records for the entire week. So I would listen to them once and I would listen to them again. Um, and it was fascinating how I would immediately get more connected to this person. And to be real, like I didn't ask my bestest friends what they were listening to or what their favorite thing was because I kind of already knew that. So I identified people, <clears throat> I identified people in my life who I love and admire and wanted to get closer to, um, which took a little bit of vulnerability for me. Um, there's this tech director at my job named David Brewer and David Brewer is so intelligent and um, such an interesting character. Uh, and I know that he used to play the saxophone and I knew that he was into jazz and I was really curious about that. So I just asked him one day, I was like, hey, Brewer is what we call him. I was like, hey, Brewer, can you give me uh, a record or two that you really love? Um, and I think it turned out to be a little bit of a daunting task because there's so much um, that he loved. But he was able to share with me this Stan Getz Live record that um, I spent the week listening to. And instead of talking about work at, at lunch, we then started talking about music and it was just a wonderful way that um, our connection got deeper with this person that I knew had something great that uh, I could learn from and connect about and we did, it was awesome. Another person that I asked about one week, two records was my mom. And I have never asked my mom about music. There's always been music in the house but I've like never asked my mom about music. It was just always present. Um, and you know, like this extra layer of experience growing up. So I asked my mom, I was like, mom, can you give me like one or two records that are your favorite? And she did not miss a beat. She texted me back immediately. And she said, Barsat Kirat. And I was like, wow, she, this was, she was so definitively ready with that answer. I felt like when I had asked, other people, when I'd ask Brewer, it was a little bit of like, oh, there's so much stuff out there, but she knew immediately. So Barsak Kirat is a Bollywood film that came out in the 60s, I think. Um, and the soundtrack has Lata Mangeshkar and Mohammed Rafi, who are basically the pinnacle of that sound of that time. So I found the record on Spotify, I put it on, and I was immediately transported to my mom's kitchen. I could, I felt like I was there right with her in her kitchen. I could smell the onions cooking in with the cumin seeds crackling and the black mustard seeds starting to simmer. And I was in this thick cloud of warm smelling masala in her kitchen, 3000 miles away from exactly where I was. And I was suddenly like face to face with my mom. I was. 12 years old hearing these songs at 40 for the first time. And you know, it made me think that there's something about connecting through music and art or just any artifact that's given from one friend to another or a family member to another that adds value. Um, these memories that were so visceral to me um, had already been embedded in my life so many years ago, but I never intentionally understood it until I asked my mom that question. Hey mom, do you have 
a favorite record or song that you could share with me. And she was able to share this record, which was actually a conduit for time travel. So how do you do that? How do you get into this one week, two records, practice, and connect with people um, in this way through listening and slowing down and noticing? So just identify someone you're close with and some, or someone you want to get closer to. You know, in the case for me, it was like, the really cool, smart jazz nerd at work and my mom and uh, also some other friends who I used to see a lot but don't see uh, very often anymore. Um, I felt like kind of choosing from that pool, I knew I was gonna get a rich variety of recommendations. Um, I also happen to be blessed with a really uh, wildly mixed group of friends and people in my life. Um, so I was gonna get a wild mix back, uh, which, in turn was going to help dimensionalize me even further. Um, just ask them for a full record uh, and it doesn't have to be physical. I mean, if you're, if you are a record collector and you are able to trade records, that's awesome in this time, but everything is available on the internet, Spotify, you, YouTube, Apple music, whatever you use. Um, and just listen to it from end to end. I think like we are in a lot of patterns of just listening to one song at a time but I kind of dare you to listen to a full record. Um, this artist spent a lot of time making that and we sh as listeners and as an audience should spend time respecting that. I think, you know, music is an interesting art form because it does require your time. When I talk about putting on a record and, you know, listening to a whole side of it, I know I'm making a certain time commitment um, but it's almost a gift of exchange that I'm, I'm committing to with that artist. So listen to the whole record and, you know, notice how you feel. What do you like? What don't you like? This music is kind of a membrane for conversation with the friend that recommended it to you and yourself. Ideally, when you're listening to it, who knows where you're being transported to, if it's to the kitchen you grew up in when you're 12 years old or just to, you know, a future vision of what romance can be. I don't know. But um, that friend recommended that music to you for a reason. And you can start to unpack that a little bit. So listen to it end to end and start to think about like, what are you hearing? What are you learning? What are you feeling? How are you thinking about that friend? Who else is it making you think about? Start doing an inventory of all of those things. And then talk to your friend about the record. Um, I think that's the best part. Like this is a place where you can engage about um, you know this this material this music and talk about all of these different things you know feelings storytelling time travel wherever it took you and you know be vulnerable with your approach allow yourself to be transported to this new place or new feeling allow yourself to get closer to the people that you do this with allow yourself to be yourself in order to find yourself and what I mean by that is be honest as you're listening and take the time. As you're listening, maybe something doesn't move you and you can be honest about that. Maybe your friend is like, this thing makes me feel all the feelings. I cry and I, you know, I, I feel like someone finally gets me and you listen to it and you're like, I don't get it. That's okay too, but at least you can consider your friend as you're listening to it and start to understand them and understand that this art form, this music has really moved them. And I, ideally you can get them a little more. Maybe it's going to turn you off and you're like, wow, I don't know how that moved you, but I guess I'm asking you to be vulnerable and try to open up and think about how, you know, that input affected them. You know, a rekindling of community through a medium that naturally evokes emotion is kind of harder and harder to come by right now. I think leveraging conversation with your community and just like carving out the time to spend is a rich place for sparking something new in your mind. So the other activity I have um, is about looking. And you know, I, I've mentioned this a little bit before, but we just take in millions of images every day without even looking at our phones. I think once we pick up our phones, uh, the number is just exponentially raised. How can we just slow down and notice what we're seeing again? I have this simple game I like to play at art shows. Um, and I made it up because a lot of times I would notice I would like go to art shows or go to a gallery and people were there convening and talking and partying or taking pictures of themselves. But I noticed 
less and less people were spending time with the artwork and I wanted to find a way to, you know, be with the people that I was with in the gallery and also engage with the art. That was the reason that we were there. Um, so in this time, uh, you can play this with your family or your partner, or if you're alone, I can talk through also uh, how you can play this, you know, over Zoom or um, there's, there's ways of connecting through art and this game, whether you're with someone or with, without. Um, and you can leverage the world's art collections. All kinds of museums all around the world have their collections available online or just some of them. Um, and I've got a link here that you can check out. Okay, so the looking exercise or game or activity is called Picky Taki. So Picky Taki is essentially where you are looking at a grid of paintings or drawings or art or shoot, it could be flowers in a garden. Um, it could be cars in a driveway. It can be so many different things, but for the sake of art, I'll talk about it that way. Um, but don't be afraid to get creative with what you're looking at and observing. I threw together a bunch of illustrations that I did kind of randomly. So take this grid of images in front of you and find somebody who you want to play this with, or just imagine the person you want to play it with. If it's your family member, your partner, call somebody on Zoom, y'all can chat about it. So I'm going to pick my favorite and you pick your favorite. That's how you're going to set it up. Each person picks their favorites, but nobody discloses what they like the most. And then the goal is for you to try to guess your friend's favorite. And you're not just going to try to guess it by being like, I think you like that one, period. That's not engaging your sort of noticing and observ uh, observing brain. You want to say, um, like if I was looking at this grid in particular and I was thinking about my friend Ravi, I would say, Okay, I would think about Ravi and I would think about what do I know about him and what do I know about the things that he likes and the things that he responds to. I would say, okay, I'm looking at this grid of images and Rav, I think that out of all of these, I know that you like basketball and I know that you're a like really playful person. So I think you would pick the one that's got the basketball hoop with the ball coming into the hoop and the eyes looking up really excited because it's playful, it's basketball, it's like really you. So really what I'm doing is I'm delivering a little bit of a portrait of what I understand about this person through this art. And, you know, I've played this game many times with friends and who knows, maybe I was wrong. Maybe Ravi's like, hey, no, that's not what I picked. Actually, I picked the horse with the basketball. So you were sort of right, but I liked the really strong imagery of, of this horse and kind of weird juxtaposition of the two things together. Now. The thing about this is, I don't care that I'm wrong. It's not about winning. This exercise is really about learning about your friend's sensibilities and also your own to be able to describe what you see in a piece of artwork and how you see another person in it. Um, it is, I think, really fun and I hope that you try, try it out. Uh, there was one time that I was playing this with a friend and we were in a gallery. It was a Tim Lahan show and he's one of my favorite artists. Um, and we were looking at, you know, this grid of drawings and I had picked my favorite and they had picked their favorite. And then the person said to me, uh, Nishat, I think this one is your favorite. And it was this drawing of a tire. It almost looked like a tractor trailer tire, like the kind that's so hard that you like, if you punched it, you, it would be like, it would hurt your hand. Like there's no way you could penetrate it. So it was this really, really thick kind of tire, but it had uh, melted or deflated and there was some text on it. I can't remember what that said. And my friend said, Nishat, I think you like this drawing because it reminds me of you. It's this really hard, impenetrable thing that is, showing itself uh, to be vulnerable, that it can, uh, it can collapse, it can deflate. And I, it was not what I had picked. It was not what I had picked. But that portrait of myself that this person had said to me and had seen through this piece of art really kind of pierced right into my heart because I was like, whoa, I, Yes, I'm tough on the outside and soft on the inside, but you just broke that down through a piece of artwork that I was ready to kind of dismiss because I was in love with this garbage bag instead. 
And you know, this is really a practice of knowing yourself and knowing others through that common medium. It's a practice of dissecting what you see and reframing it. And they may seem overly simplified, um, but they help us understand who we are, what we like, and how we can like something. So in playing this game, I learned that there are people that know things that I haven't even really said about myself. In listening to the music I asked for, I was able to transport in time. And by taking this look around, I think I was also able to take this look within. I fortified my own creative self. I connected with my community and deepened existing relationships and cultivated new ones. And through these activities, just fortified my creative autonomy. I actually want to make two album recommendations to you just to start this conversation. Um, so if you're alone like me and you don't have somebody to talk to about this, let me be the first person to give this to you. The first record I'm going to recommend is Silsila, which is a 1970s Bollywood film, which is a beautiful soundtrack. Check it out. And then the second one is from an uh, R&B duo in Chicago called Drama and their first record, Gallows. Um, so have a listen to those two. So I'm going to leave you with one last thing, which is a song from this film, uh, Barsat Ki Rat, that my mom had recommended. Thank you so much. I hope that you try these uh, activities and games out for looking around yourself and looking within. So thanks so much, y'all. So how great was that? Thank you so much, Nishat. It was fantastic. A big thank you to all of this morning's speakers. And as a reminder, all of this year's talks are available on demand. Watch them anytime you want at behance.net slash 99U. Now we're going to take a short break. And we'll be back here at 12.15 p.m. Eastern. And here's what's coming up next. At 12 p.m. Eastern, so in just a couple minutes, we're opening the first of two limited edition giveaways. The first one's a postcard set from our friends at Adobe Fresco and Mama Sauce. It's really spectacular. Be sure to check it out. At 12.15 p.m. Uh, 12, 15 p.m. Eastern, we'll be streaming a live workshop with illustrator Octavia Bromel and Adobe's Jinjin Sun. So this is fully live. It's going to be really fun. Then at 1.15 p.m. Eastern, we'll be featuring a live Q&A with creative coach Tina Smaker, who will guide us through the Creative Self Workbook. And then at 2 p.m. Eastern, designer and paper engineer Kelly Anderson joins us for a live workshop hosted by Beyonce's very own Jeannie Huang. So I will see you this afternoon at 3.15 p.m. Eastern for more talks delving into the creative self. Please stick around. Lots of great stuff to come. Thank you.